the meeting we had with them today was very instructive, and uh, I would feel that we we really do need to look at this area as a, a unique area for growth. There's not a lot of growth over in the southern area on the, on our new structure things, and they're also saying that their whanau are coming home, and they will look at within the, the they're going to do it in stages, it won't be all just opened up, it will be done in stages, so that the development won't happen until so many are done, but they want to get the plan changed through so they've got surety of what they're doing. And when their whanau are coming home, they'd like to know that they can actually maybe build some whanau houses in there as well that will fit for their whanau to, to come home to, something to come back to. And I, I feel that the whole concept over there isn't, isn't like a structure you're seeing a new subdivision being built as you're coming into Taupo. This is a whole unique, different feel. Over in that little tiny corner in the south, you've got people who come there don't come from around the whole other area. They, they, they live there. They actually, some people work in Taumanui and live there. There's a whole different section of, the, of communities that will be drawn and are drawn to that area. And I think in its uniqueness and um, the aspirations that have been worked on for, for since the 70s with this hapu uh, really need to be looked at and addressed in a, in a different and looked at in a different light to just a black and white light. Thank you. Tom, do you want to add anything to what I've said? Councillor <laughs> Kingy. <coughs> well, thank you, Maggie. Uh, Maggie pretty much said it all, so I attended the same meeting. I, I guess um, my awareness of this um, of this plan is, is somewhat new, but I understand, um, and, and Maggie's provided some some overview to the timeline here, which is which is a long time. Uh, but I, I suppose fundamentally, sitting sitting in the back of my mind, are, are two things. You know, I, I understand what you've said Nick, in terms of, um, you know, we've had experts talk about oversupply of of, of developments or or, or houses or whatever you call it, but we we, we have limited opportunity um, in the southern part of the lake to develop. Um, yep, we've we've got some splotches here on our map around Kurato and Mori uh, and some in Turangi. But what we have in Fariro is a trust that is ready to go. Who have lined up their ducks. Who have got iwi, hapu, community, uh, you know, on file as being supportive. So to me, it's like. Potentially, council's going to be the one that could be the bad wolf here in terms of stopping development. So, I really, I'd, I'd like that to be reconsidered, and I'd, and I'd like for us to move into a phase of how can we support this community to develop their land, uh, which was returned to them. I think, in terms of the Fadi Law landscape, you know, I, I understand some of the principles around how you use modelling and forecasting. Um, but, like Maggie alluded to, the trust has tried to tr try to manage the the growth within Fadi Law based on selling parts of land to fund other things. So it's been a long-term goal. So I think my, my understanding of where they're at is that they're, they're now in a position of being prepared and they'd like to take that next step. I suppose from my perspective here, sitting here as a councillor, is, is what can we do to help them facilitate the next stage of that? Um, Recognising that you know, for the, for the initial stage, they have all the risk. They have to build the roads, they have to build the infrastructure. Yes, it will be potentially come back to council, I guess, but um, I, I, it'll be a sad day if we can't promote um, some growth and activity in the southern parts of the district. Okay, any other groups? Uh, Councillor Park? Uh, yes, thank you, and I understand it's a refresh of the former document, but is there any <coughs> reason apart from possibly that there's no growth plan for sort of Mangakino, Aratiatia, Warake, that sort of northern sort of west part of the district but you've got your two maps but is, there's not a map that covers the rest of the district so I'm just wondering is that because there is no growth or is that because I guess uh, two things to bear in mind uh, the first of all the purpose of TD 2050 is to look at growth at a macro scale across the district so let's talk about where are our urban areas going to expand to there will always be activity um, beyond those urban areas. We'll get someone who wants to build a house on a, um, on a piece of rural land or someone who wants to 
put a tourist operation uh, out in the southwestern settlements. Um, this strategy is not about those those small scale developments. The district plan is the vehicle that you use to control those right. site specific developments. This is about where do towns grow, um, and are we going to idealistically shift the way that we manage the whole of the rural environment? Um, okay. So, so it's very much that macro planning. Okay. Um, sorry, and sorry. Secondly, um, do we have any idea where the census data will, will be available? Yeah. So you'll be aware that census uh, went online this year. Uh, that posed some challenges for them. They had a lower return rate than they've historically had. I think it was about a 90% return rate, whereas they're normally up around the 95, 96% return rate. That means that they need to do some work around uh, corroborating the information they got on census night with other data sets, and that takes time. Um, so the signal from Statistics New Zealand is that the first release of data that we will get uh, is March 2019. Um, so that'll be uh, very much at a territorial authority level and a regional level. We won't start to get that census area unit information until uh, a number of months after that. Um, so it's basically delayed. <laughs> That's the hope. <laughs> Yeah. Um, just one thing, first councillor body is listening on webcam and has asked that we speak up. <laughs> so, long way to Greece, yes. Um, Nick, just, and, and team, what are your timings for the consultation? Because I see this particular discussion is a very important starting block, particularly with our district plan review coming up and with our transport and water because you know, we're guided by the MPS and the urban development and the Waikato regional policies in this area, so this is really, really important and it needs to be done soon. Yep. So, so our anticipation is, uh, what are we, end of July, we'd be going out in the next couple of weeks, so essentially we'd be consulting uh, mid-August to mid-September and then looking to move to hearings as fast as possible after that. So just in terms of the district plan review, I know that's not this discussion, but when... Yes. When does that process start? Did you wanna? Um, we're coming to talk to you next week. We've got a workshop um, oh, booked right. in next week. We're just um, in the planning phases at the moment and getting a lot of the scheduling and, and timing and processes all sorted out, so that's all done up front. And we're going to talk to you more about that um, on Tuesday next week, um, and we can talk through those Time timings further. Yeah. Okay. But you're right, this is definitely one of the preemptive steps um, before that's, that kicks off. Okay. Awesome, thank you, and, and pleased to see you've done some pre-consultation in some of those key areas as well. Thank you. Councillor uh, Hickley. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. I'd just like to support uh, Maggie's uh, um, submission to try and uh, facilitate uh, wire up. Um, I was on the initial planning committee some many years ago, actually, I think. Uh, so this has been going on for a number of years and they obviously are to a stage where they are almost ready to move so I would like to support uh, Magius and Tonganui's uh, to try and uh, um, facilitate that movement through this uh, document Your Worship. And I identify it as a, a growth area. Yeah, so um, same sentiment as Barry. Like, if these are the, were the red blob areas that we have told our community are, are going to be potential, so they've done all this work, and then all of a sudden the new ones say they're not. How do, how do we make that decision from their point of view? Why, why us, and why do we get uh, out of it and not someone else? So I just think this in particular is one area we need to put back in, and how can we do that? Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, okay, a couple of things uh, falling out of this. Um, the first is, uh, I guess, just to make it very clear, we've been talking to them for a number of years about this issue. So uh, I've been talking to jo Joanne and her consultant team since 2007 about the development of that block. Um, so a long involvement. Um, for the last, uh, since the last census information came out, we've been signaling to them that the growth 
the anticipated growth is more subdued than was previously indicated. So there's been a number of years of conversation to say that the world back in 2006 has shifted and as a council who administers uh, our responsibility as a planning authority and as an infrastructure provider, we also need to think about how our ideas shift and our planning shifts because the world's not stagnant. Um, so that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that um, uh, since the 70s, Fori Roa as an existing settlement has been progressively developed. Uh, and I believe it's got to a point where the trustees have sold all the land interests that they have in that existing settlement. That's not to say there aren't vacant properties. Um, we believe there's somewhere between 50 and 52 vacant properties sitting in existing Fori Roa, uh, which are obviously in private ownership, uh, but with our house built on them. That's capacity for somewhere between 25 and 30 years of growth based on uh, historical building consent rates. So there's some existing capacity within existing Fori Roa. Um, however, we're hearing a pretty clear sentiment uh, from around the table that you wish to see Fori Roa included. That raises some challenges in that it uh, it goes contrary to the direction that's underpinning the strategy, which talks about the supply and council meeting that supply. Sorry, talks about the demand and council meeting that with appropriate supply and measuring that with infrastructure investment. What I'd suggest uh, is you give us a little bit of time to pop down the back over a few items. Uh, we'll see if we can come up with some words that enable Fori Roa to go in, but um, mitigate those risks and avoid uh, undercutting the rest of the strategy. Would that, would that work? Because it's very important for this team, we need to look at the guiding principles of these national policy statements and, and the work that goes behind this about council's requirement to provide efficient and effective infrastructure. So you can't go doing one thing for one area and one for another. It's counterintuitive. Yes. Yeah, no, um, so I agree with all of that. I guess it comes down to that philosophy of the stats information, though. So, so it comes down to whether or not we believe the, the peak population, as what we've been told by, by Nidia and others in Stats New Zealand, or we believe that our um, influences can change that through economic development and other things. So that's the, that's the key fundamental thing for me. And we had this discussion with industrial land, as an example, in this very strategy. And you'll see now um, that... I think it's 0 0.7, 16, 17, 18, we're doing, we've said the team will do some more work over the next little while to look at what the demand for industrial growth is in industrial land as it develops. So <coughs> I'm sure there's a way for Whareroa to go into that same mix that it's around as things change, then, then this can be provided for. So as Nick says, a little bit of extra time mm. might be able to get to, to something around that. Because we're hearing what you're saying, you know, Whareroa is important for you to, to provide for. Okay, so... Um, um, Obviously, all those points are extremely valid, but I'm my confusing confusion was uh, about the population peaking and then see a decline. I just don't understand that. With all the developments that are going on, all the subdivisions, mm. all of the you know growth that we see, um, I don't understand where that's coming from. Well, <coughs> that data has come directly from Statistics New Zealand, um, and my understanding is based on a few things, not only migration, which is people coming in, um, but there's, there's a thing called structural ageing, which is the New Zealand, actually the world population is getting older, um, and at some point in the future, uh, we'll see that there's a point where more people are dying than being born. Um, a lot of countries are already in that phase, I know Europe's already there, the US is already there, um, Japan is already there, and at some point, this is statistics information, um, that they project that New Zealand will get to that point too where we've got more people dying than are being born. Um, outside of bringing in a whole lot of people from outside of New Zealand, um, the evidence is that's quite hard to turn around. So I think that's the basis for where the, the peak population comes from. Councillor uh, Stewart. Yes, just going back to Fire Roa, sorry. Um, I'm really pleased that we'll go you go and have a look at something, Nick. Um, but please just keep in mind that they have been working with the documents that they had to work with. 
and they are um, it's disadvantaged now to think that things are going to change but also the uniqueness of that environment will I, I feel will attract people to that environment far more than going down the road to Omori Kiritau where there are is, is residential land there now so I, I think that with the uniqueness of what they're going to be putting there it, it will attract the people to come so I'll be interested to see what you come back with Nick Uh, can attract a lot more people than probably other developments. So, um, A, because they've worked so long and they've got to this point now, um, I think we, we should try to accommodate them in this present document. Councillor uh, Park. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Just un uh, under the assumptions, um, under 4.1 in it, it talks about holiday home ownership will remain at approximately 30%. That's what the projection is, is that correct? Right, and then the footnote at the bottom and it talks about low fertility and the large ageing baby boom, low fertility. Should it not say smaller sized families or? Well, fertility essentially means less people being born. Um, so that, that's coming back to the point I was saying before. So you've got mortality, which is people dying and fertility, which is people being born. So, um, you know, probably for the last 20 years, birth rates in New Zealand have been declining. Um, that's what that's referenced I'm, I'm just to. wondering from a, a, a layman's perspective, for, for, it's a language thing. You go out and, and, and want public to, cons you know, to engage public, and I just wonder if perhaps we maybe should reword that because low fertility means <laughs> different things to different people. OK. Uh, Councillor Williamson? Sorry, you? Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Now, I've been... We'll go way back five minutes now. We're always to start with. Um, I'll, st <laughs> I'll just start with um, obviously with the um, with the review of the district plan, our growth projections, etc. We've had. Um, I remember two or three years ago we had a meeting in um, the old chamber with Rangatiri, the Glory, and we had a few conversations with the Glory over the years. And obviously the same principles would apply under the the district plan or the what we've um, attesting to to try and apply is that they could still apply with a res through a resource consent to develop it but it would still be would depend would still be dependent on their, their district plan review they, they could still apply it doesn't mean to say that they would well originally I mean for going back originally they all I'm pleased the colors have changed to red blobs to orange because there was a, some misunderstanding that it was actually hadn't been even designed as urban it was still rural so um, so I think so I so that would be the same as kind of parallel to what we're having with Forerra, or is, I understand. Well, I do accept what Maggie and Tong and Barry are saying. It is a unique, perhaps a unique situation that could be um, made with an exception, if that's possible, or you know, being able to do. Um, sorry, Dan. <laughs> I I don't see Forerra as being an exception. I see it being as a, as a standing in its own right that it will develop. Okay. Sorry, Maggie, you misinterpreted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, just wondering, are there any other areas no. that you know that were red blobs that had been taken off that are potent, like in a similar situation are going to be shocked? Yes. That, are, uh, so that, have, that so have done this like, so same sort of work? So the very, uh, the very obvious one is the Marpra Valley. Um, so mm -hmm just over the hill. We had anticipated that we would require a settlement of around about 2,000 residential homes there. Um, we talked about a small town centre, a private school. Uh, we zoned that land after structure planning. Um, we then designated the road and corridor to link through that valley out to Kinloch and uh, identified in the district plan how that land would unfold. Um, our proposal is to remove all of that uh, on the assumption that we cannot justify placing that in. Th there is simply not the demand, and if it goes ahead, then it brings with it an infrastructure burden for the community. 
which we simply cannot justify. So, so that's one area. Uh, there was an area that was identified just north of Waitahanui. Um, at the time, 2005, six, uh, the owners had talked about doing a very specific development with hoppers, um, who essentially did the waterways development in uh, Fitianga. So it was a very particular type of development. That's obviously fallen by the wayside through the global financial crisis, and as we understand it, there's no intention for developing there. Um, Rangitera E and Pinautiakau have both come out. Um, we've talked to those two um, groups of stakeholders, uh, and <coughs> We're looking to take a very different approach with that land. Um, as you will have seen on the front page of the paper recently, Painatiaka is going through a partitioning process. <coughs> what that means is that it's not, it's not appropriate for conventional subdivision. It, it's not appropriate to turn into uh, another Brentwood, as an example. We're going to have a very different way of looking at development on that land that's going to reflect uh, the multiple ownership um, and, and those challenges that that tenure brings with it. Um, rather than having one or two landowners who are looking to uh, unroll a whole lot of residential development, we're going to have multiple landowners who are going to have their own very specific outcomes that they're looking for their pieces of land. So what we've talked to them about is dealing with that in, uh, in the wings of the district plan as being a much more appropriate and flexible way rather than what we've got in TD 2050, which is um, very much a model set up for enabling that standard residential development to take place. It, it, it has. And, it, and even in Marks of Valley, the designations are on some of that land there, and I think the growth of that has got people from utilising the land out there. Yes. Well. So w the pre-consultation that we've already done with the owners out in the Marfa Valley has been very positive uh, for exactly the reason. They can see that there's no demand to build more residential housing out there, and they understand the frustration that the current planning rules create because it's trying to protect that land for that future urban development. So there seems to be general support for that. Um, it, we may have someone who comes out of left field through the submission process, but at the moment that's generally the sentiment. Yes. Councillor Hicklin. <coughs> uh, just, just trying to get my mind squared up a little bit. Um, but am I right in thinking, Nick, that um, should we say a a developer that's not identified as a growth area could apply through the district plan and, uh, and do a private plan change and apply to develop that land through his own private, um, what do they call it? A, a private a, plan a, change. A private plan change. That, is that, that's correct, yes. isn't it? Yes. yes. So we, we're not stopping anybody from actually developing their land, we're just saying we'd prefer it in these areas. Well, we're saying exactly that, we would yep. prefer it in these areas based on these reasons, yep. Yep. and yep. if someone wants to pop in uh, somewhere else yep. and propose um, a, a new settlement or uh, some large-scale subdivision into yep. residential, then they would have to go through all those all tests, those tests that, yep. 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 Uh, that the Farrow plan change process is going to have to yeah, go through yeah, in terms yeah. of generating that, uh, sorry, proving that there's a demand and proving that the um, the impacts on lights yeah. of infrastructure and the environment can yeah. be addressed. Yeah. We'd need to be really clear though, just to answer that from an expectation perspective, mm -hmm. that if it's not in, the stro in this yeah. growth strategy, no, it's it's gonna, if it's not, it's, it's going to make it a damn sight harder when oh, you get to that. It, so we need to be honest with that. Yeah. It to, the, to the extent that as officers we'd be recommending against it. Mm. Yeah, because but it's not it doesn't a actually stop them from actually going through the process. In law, nothing stops them, mm. yeah. but the cards will be stacked against them. Against them. Yeah. Uh, so at, at the moment we've got an application for a resource consent which has come in for Kaipo Road, uh, which is an area which is outside of any identified growth area. and So they've lodged their resource consent. They're going to have to prove uh, that 
that style of development in that location is appropriate. And as Gareth says, the district plan is very much stacked up at an objective and a policy level to dissuade people from doing that, because there are good reasons for doing that. Councillor so. Kingy. Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, yeah, it's a hell of a thing, really, just trying to get your head around it. Um, I sort of come back to um, Rosie's comments before. I mean, the mind boggles, I, I think. Have you tried to buy a house lately or tried to rent one? Yeah, and it's, it's very difficult. So I, my mind's going, well, that surely means there's not enough out, on, out there to, to, to acquire. But just coming back to Whareroa, um I guess... Um, you know, it's important that Gareth just mentioned what he said because I was going to ask that question. So, how, how do we make sure that uh, that that we can provide an opportunity for a community like this, given that they have signalled this 30 years ago that this is what they wanted to do? It's not anything new. It didn't come up last week. It didn't come up last year. It started 30 years ago. So, there's been a constant movement towards this. Yes, they've had to jump through a few hoops and organise themselves, but I, I don't think there's been a, a lack of intent. It's probably just preparing their their case. Uh, for us, but you know, for whatever you know, can can I just please uh, express a view that we we need to try and be reflective of what our communities are. One brush stroke for the whole district. I understand that might be okay in some things, but you know what what Maggie's pointed out is is absolutely correct. The the some of the things that they're talking about in, in, in their plan and their development are around um, have an environmental impact. You know, manuka forest. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to be proactive about these things. Now, I don't see that necessarily with all developments that we approve. So, I'm just, I guess, I'm just raising. You know, let's let's look at sometimes when we have the opportunity to look at something that has a positive impact, not just for that community, or but other, you know, other positive things that sort of could come out of it. So, yeah. Loud and clear. You want us to go away and look at Parido. The rest of the the strategy. Are you, are you okay with the rest? Or are I, I just wanted to bring one, one attention, um, Gareth, if I could, and make um, page 118. I see a little sliver there at Whariwaka Point in front of those um, <coughs> rather expensive houses. Uh, am I correct in that? I haven't got the colours here, but um, so say Victory Drive, those houses in Victory Drive. Um, they end up with houses in front. Correct. So, so you'll remember through previous conversations about the treaty settlement between the Crown and Ngāti Tuwharatā. Yep. As part of that settlement process, land at Five Mile Bay is going back from the Crown to Tuwharatā. Um, there are a number of different land parcels there. Um, you'll be aware uh, if you're in the Whariwaka subdivision, you've got the lookout area and then you've got that large uh, raised area of grass which is looks like a reserve that will stay as a scenic reserve at the edge of that it drops off down towards the lake the land down on that lower level next to the lake will be identified uh, through the tree settlement as fee simple land with a height restriction on it in recognition of those adjacent landowners so there's a clear signal from the Crown and Tuwharatoa that they have aspirations for the development of that land in some shape or form. So We're not sure exactly what those aspirations will unfold as, um, so we've signalled that that land will be a growth area in the future, particularly given it sits between two existing uh, urban areas and it's got services running past it, um, so it's appropriate. Uh, as a development area. What we're not certain about is exactly what the density of development in there will be and what those servicing issues will be. So we've signalled that there's a need for a little bit more work. That's why it's amber. But we've anticipated that that will become urban at some point in the future. Now, we fully expect that there may well be some uh, submissions from adjacent landowners through this process talking about the appropriateness of that and whether there should be uh, another level of control over that development. That's something that will no doubt uh, be flushed out through the consultation process, and, and that's why we have the consultation process. Yeah, cool. So so there is a, is on the raised part, so more down the bottom you're, yeah. you're talking so, about? So yeah, so down at lake level. Okay, down the lake level, yeah. We, we all know it was going to freehold land, but we're just, we're just going to brace ourselves for certainly submissions regarding that.
Yeah. Would it help to have, we've got some um, deep, more detailed maps that we could flick through which, which label each land piece and what it's been designated for, yep. so we can flick those through just so that you've got... That would be good, certainly, when we go out, from, you know. When we, the, and just another query I have, the industrial land, uh, 175 hectares, uh, you're saying that's plenty? You're saying that's plenty? Uh, are we to know that? So on the face of it, yeah. uh, that's more than sufficient to meet the anticipated demand. What we're uh, conscious of is that some of that land is owned by Contact Energy. So it sits around uh, the Tehoka Power Station and around the back of the, um, the native plant nursery, as it currently is. Um, so there's some, some well sites, but they've signalled in the past an intent to use the lies that for some industrial activities. We want to do a little bit more finer grained analysis just to make sure that that land is available for industrial use in the future. If it proves not to be, then we need to just do a little bit of a recheck and make sure that we've got sufficient going forward. Um, but at the moment that's a little bit of an unknown. On the face of it, we look okay because we've got 175 uh, zoned, we think we need about 60 for the next 20 years. So uh, on a basic comparison we look okay, but we, as I say, we want to look closer particularly into that contact energy land and make sure it is truly available for future industrial development. Now if that, if that shifts, we've got the ability through the district plan change, oh, sorry, through the district plan review to then adjust and zone more land. So you, you've got two mechanisms in play here. Okay, all right, thank you, Nick. I think we're sort of pretty ready to go. So we'll, we'll just leave a resolution just at the moment. You'll go away and um, we'll just put that one on hold at the moment until you come back with some clever, some good words. All right, so back to, where are we? 5.6, uh, which is now 5.2. Taupo District Council's submission on the draft national planning standards. Hillary. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so this is um, this is quite interesting, and um, these have been coming for a little while, um, and finally they've um, had our desk as a draft. So um, there's been lot, quite a lot of discussion amongst um, authorities around the country about how this is going to work. Um, we are in the very fortunate position that, um, with our review um, being due now, we can quite easily pick up. Um, the new template and use it with our um, district plan and make adjustments where things are not going to match up. Other councils are going to be trying to rejig their current plans um, into the new format which is going to lead to a whole lot of consequential amendments um, which I suspect may end up um, in court quite a lot of the time. So um, our submission really just focuses on a few niggly bits and pieces where we're a bit confused about how they will work and um, so I guess we've, we've asked quite a few questions of clarification um, around, around those implementation mechanisms and um, that type of thing but otherwise um, some things it will make easier for us because there will be a standard set of um, definitions and that will apply across the country for example and they won't be up for grabs um, when we go through the review um, they won't be able to be challenged because they are as set through the um, planning standards Okay, thanks Hilary Any questions of Hilary? Yeah. Pretty straightforward Alright, the suggested uh, recommendation there uh, that we approve the submission to go through to the draft national planning standards. Could I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Jolland, seconded by Councillor Williamson. All those in favour, please say aye. It's against. Carried. Now, uh, just a slight another rearrangement. I, I noticed a lot of busy people in the in the in the back um, of the room there. So I'll bring 5.7 forward. If that's okay. Public site, uh, public art site approval. Who's presenting this one? So I'll present it from a staff perspective. I'm just wondering, Dave, do you want to come forward at all and say anything? Um, so from a staff perspective, um, we've got a number of sites which you've identified for sculpture um, around the town. Um, this this proposal uh, for a piece of art um, 
which hasn't been designed, hasn't been identified as one of those sites. Um, that's not to say that it's not an appropriate site, and our officers are actually very supportive of this location. It's just that it wasn't one that was identified in the um, in the initial stages when we identified bulk locations. Um, in terms of the piece itself, the items in the or the information's in the item. I'll let, um, let the team talk about that. Um, I guess as you'll see. Um, this isn't a request at all for any financial assistance um, that's, that's been um, looked after um, by, by our good friends here. So it's just about the site um, location that, you're, that you've been asked to approve today. So I guess I'll hand over to the, to the team. Okay. Afternoon, gentlemen and ladies. Nice to see you, David. And um, would, uh, who would like to talk to it? Trust. Um, Hi, Nikki. Hi. Uh, so, really, I think uh, um, my involvement in the sculpture, I think, is probably clear to those who know me. Um, and Alan and Paul are, are good friends. And um, since um, Matthew's accident, when he passed away, we've decided to really try and help this uh, turn into reality, this proposal. Um, and the Sculpture Trust, obviously, um, yeah, need to get, we need to have their blessing along the way. Um, and the object of being here today is to try and get approval to, of the site. The, the proposal is still being, uh, some of the details are still being finalised, but you've, you would have seen the proposal that was submitted. Um, and obviously the Sculpture Trust have a number of pre-approved sites with, with the Council. So um, this proposed uh, location of, of the sculpture is not one of those sites. So that's why we're here today. Um, the, the sculpture is a war memorial sculpture. Um, and so the, uh, meaningfully, it needs to be close to, to a part of town where uh, you know, war memorial is often commemorated. So close to the cenotaph has uh, <coughs> seemed to be um, a good location, um, and so just outside of, uh, on the corner of Horomatangi uh, Street and Tongariro, uh, is straight across the road from the cenotaph, op opposite the Waharoa, uh, and um, it's, so it's, what, it's reasonably well connected in that regard. Uh, so we're aware, having discussed the proposal with Fraser Scott, that there's no, uh, that, that intersection is, is earmarked, earmarked for um, improvement over the next few years but it's not there's no funds allocated to it in the current um, annual plan um, so we've been going about raising money for the proposal um, and we think the the sculpture can be accommodated with minor changes to some of the garden structures at that intersection and it can be done in a way where in the future um, the general um, well, the sculpture can either remain as it is, as where it is positioned, and um, other uh, landscaping work undertaken around that, or it might need to be uplifted and 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 put down again in a revised area um, in the, at that intersection. Uh, so yeah, we we've been working with the sculpture trust for some time, um, looking at the scale of the sculpture of. Uh, the construction, the materials, um, and the appearance, um, and so whereas previously we were looking at something quite a lot bigger, we're now talking about a, a one metre high sculpture made out of, um, at this stage, Cortean steel, which is uh, what some of the other sculptures around town are made out, out of, and um, mounted on a, uh, a plinth being about 700 to a metre high, so sort of the sculpture would stand at eye level. Um, as I said before, we think that can be accommodated quite easily with minor adjustments to the gardens at the corner, and <coughs> it'll be quite effective <coughs> and um, adjacent to pedestrian traffic um, going across the um, intersection. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> yeah, I. that's about all I have to say. I don't know if Thank you. any Thank of you, the David. others want to say something. Oh, I would just like Thank to you. say that we totally endorse endorse this. It was part of the um, sculpture, school sculpture competition, 
and at the time the Sculpture Trust weren't in a position to see it through to fruition. So the fact that you know it can now be built, that we are very supportive of, we support the process that these guys have gone to and in um, choosing the material, everything has been investigated, looking at sites and um, the scale of it and we are very excited about it. Cool. Oh, the other thing I should mention is the RSA, uh, very supportive as well. Paul's talked to the RSA and they're keen to see it happen and the idea of it being unveiled on Armistice Day is um, is, is really well supported as well because uh, it is a hundred years since Armistice Day and we're, uh, we'll, we're, we'll make it happen by then. It's, it, we've got a fair amount to do but we'll, we'll make sure it happens if, if, if allowed by Council. Yes, through the chair. Yeah, thanks, David, Alan, Paul, Nikki. I mean, I, you know, I, achieve, I um, um, support this on all levels. You know, as the mentioned, you know, it's celebrating Armistice Day, and sort of it, it's born out of a, a scholar, a commentary from a school, which a, a very talented young man. Um, he has no tragic, no long with us. And he was, it's on a personal level, he was with, at school with my daughter, as you know, as one of his. Um, peers and um, <coughs> so just and so even I mean we do have like even from a personal point of view we have challenges around with memorials and to me I, I think of celebrating a very talented young man um, in our community through sporting and academically and, and from a very well respected family so I support the, this proposal and all of them all second that. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions or queries? Yeah. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to acknowledge you all, and obviously today brings back memories for you, David. So, uh, uh, absolute 100% support uh, behind this. You know, he was a great young man, and yep. the community still mourns about it. So. Uh, David, if you can pass on to your wife as well, um, and so that um, yeah, you. We're, we're more than happy to do this. Absolute honour. So it's um, been uh, moved by Councillor Park, seconded by Councillor Williamson. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. It's against. Gary, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <coughs> right, 5.1. Naming of Public Roads uh, 60 Parikawa Drive Subdivision. Page 47. Darren. Darren. Good afternoon, Darren. Good afternoon. Um, so I take this as read. Um, there has been some slight recent changes in discussion around one of these names, um, but that was around the, the Kohai way, uh, but happy to take on board any comments um, if you have those to, to begin with. Okay, any questions of Darren? Yeah, just, just through the chair, um, I, I'm pretty sure I did read this thoroughly, but was there any consultation with the local hapu or relative iwi? Yes, that, that's right. So um, we encouraged the applicant to um, 
he, he spoke with Dominic Belden uh, over the appropriate um, iwi um, persons to contact. So we have approval from iwi. Um, yes, Dylan, did you have anything to comment? Yeah. Um, so, Kira councillors, just to extend on, on the comments made, uh, we're looking to remove kōhai and kōwhai as options. Uh, one of the reasons around that is the, the number of kōwhai that are uh, in in the district, if one that's at Pukonga, which is a significant uh, difference, and Councillor Kingy in his other role would have a, an issue around turning right or left, leaving the station. Um, so the proposal is for the alternative name to come forward, which is Kōr Mahi Mahi. Uh, I've had a conversation in the last hour with the same person, which was Te Kanawa, who was uh, reviewed the names initially, uh, and he's happy with Kōr Huhu and Kōr Mahi Mahi as the two names being put forward for council view um, for those two places in Motuapa. Yeah. So okay. just through the chair to add to that, so the emergency services were also consulted on the alternatives just in case? Correct, yes. Yep. Right, thanks. So, um, how do you pronounce the first one, sorry? Kohuhu. Uh, how do you spell it, I mean, sorry. K macron O, H macron U, H macron U. Cool. <coughs> All right. My well, seven councillors, are you happy with those? Yep. Moved by Councillor Kingy, seconded by Councillor Stewart. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those against, carried. Lovely. Thanks, Darren. Thank uh, you. Right. 5.2 contract uh, road marking contract. Mr. Dennis Lewis. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Worship, councillors. I've um, got a um, report here for the um, acceptance of a tender for road marking. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I'll take the um, items read and ask for any questions. Thank you, Dennis. Any questions to Dennis regarding the road marking? <coughs> That'll be done. Um, sorry, just through the chair, are these our current contractors? Yes, they are the incumbent. Well, uh, the incumbent finished on the 30th of June, so but they are the they were the current contractor. I thought it was really nice to see that it came under the estimate as well this time. I'm happy to move. Thanks, moved by Councillor Park, seconded by Councillor Stewart. All those in favour, please say aye. It's against. Carried. Thanks, Dennis. T 5.3 uh, Titoki Water Main Renewal. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, today's item yeah, is about an increase in contract value uh, for our Titoki Ave water main uh, project. Uh, by so it's increasing by one hundred and sixty-eight thousand uh, dollars to a new contract value of one million and eleven thousand. Um, I'll take the paper as read, but um, I guess just just very quickly, the contract is seventy-five percent of the way through the works and has experienced uh, ground conditions which were outside the specification in the contract, um, so they've had to abandon uh, directional drilling um, and a fair variation was put forward. Um, unfortunately it used up our contingency on the contract um, and uh, so hence the, the increase. Um, so yeah, I guess the, the in context we're still within the the, the uh, highest um, tender um, we received for the contract um, and I guess these construction jobs are always a balance between um, I guess who carries the risk and the amount of um, the, the price you get at, at the end of the job. So yeah, are there any questions? Um, you just, Thanks, just sorry, you wish it. Park. Thank you. Um, as someone who travels that area twice a day with the primary school in the middle, Open trenching, what sort of disruption to that community will there be? Um, there will be significantly more disruption than the directional drilling approach, which you generally um, is one hole at one end and, and the drill goes below the ground. Uh, but uh, this, this contractor is pretty well experienced in, in this sort of work as well. Um, they just thought, obviously, the directional drilling was a cheaper option. Um, so they'll be trenching along and laying the pipe as they go and then backfilling so and they'll use road plates and the like to ensure people can get in and out of their driveways and um, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. 
I, I have to say um, that they are very tidy contractors, just with the, the steel plating on the road and the coning and, and fencing off and whatnot. So, um, I mean, we don't know what we don't know until you dig a hole, do you? So, um, I'm happy to move. Just, thank you, Kelsey. So just picking up on that, you don't know what you don't know. But um, so there was no geotechnical, you know, like we're into this ground all the time, sort of thing. We weren't to be aware that this is. Um, in, in this um, contract, there was actually some geotech done um, on the route. So yeah. um, three boreholes were done, and the problem is uh, those boreholes all came back clean Perfect. pumice, Perfect. and that, that's what was um, then told to the contractors. So they all put in a price, which <coughs> was. You know, and we chose the lowest price. Um, unfortunately, when they started hitting a rock, and they they persevered, they laid 75% of the main um, without sort of challenging um, the status quo. And then they've actually said, "Look, we can't." When the the big pipe they're putting in, sort of like this, and they've just haven't been able to drill it through. And they've said, "Look, we need to we need okay. to talk about this." Councillor Hicken, um, I'm a little bit surprised that through our probably. Uh, um, what do we call it, um, or well, back history of subdivisions, that this this wasn't somewhere in in the process because the Richmond Heights area, when it was um, developed, it was full of rock, real hard ignite type rock, because uh, the reserve on Parkdale there, it's just you just couldn't plant a tree. It, as soon as you dug a hole, you hit rock. So I'm surprised that there was no notification on on something in in the council that um, that, that area has got quite a big problem with with hard. Mm. Any other questions or queries? Right. Yeah, so Williamson, oh, no, so it's, it's I suppose, in fairness to the staff and contractors, if there was an event of knowing, knowing it all, had crystal ball, the contract price, how long is it? Yeah. Piece of string, yeah? Yeah. It might have been another million dollars, might have been half a million. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Through the GMS issue here, that the price, you would, you'd end up paying the same amount, as just whether or not you knew about it at the start or at the end. Ideally, you'd know about it at the start. Um, as Tom explained, we did the boreholes and it, and it wasn't wasn't shown, so so unfortunately, we're paying for it at the end. So we did four holes and it just showed pumice. Yeah, that's right. So sorry, okay. through the can chair, if I, if I can add to, we've we've had a look at this, um, and so we are going to be looking at whether we need to do sink more boreholes um, going forward. Um, but you know, what we're also are doing is taking Mr. Hickling's point on on board is where we're contacting some people um, who have done a lot of work in town, some of the, the old timers, I hate to call them, yeah. um, but we want to have a chat with them because um, we all know about uh, Fuddy Walker and the big boulders out there and others. We want to be aware of any others. So. Yeah, I think mean, that's exactly what Councillor Lickler is getting at. Yeah. Councillor John? Look, it was just a technical thing, was ju just seeking assurances that the contract in terms of where the risk sat for this is with us, not with um, WIPA, whoever it was. Um, construction company, just checking that the risk for this, I mean it's unforeseen, but we, I'm just uh, doing diligence and asking whether the risk sat with us or with them. We're very clear that it's with us. Yes we are, yep. Okay, right, being moved by Councillor Park, seen by Councillor Williamson. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. It's against, carried. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, 5.4? Yeah. 5.4, speed limit, Spy Lord, 2018. Good on you, Nick. Dennis and Nick again. Yep. Me too. Good afternoon again, councillors. Uh, so hopefully no surprises in this one. Um, this essentially refers back to the deliberations you had on the 9th of July when you worked through a, a raft of changes for the speed limit bylaw. Uh, the teams work very hard. Um, unfortunately, Aidan can't be here today, along with Claire and Dieti, but uh, they've worked very hard and made all those changes, incorporated them into the bylaw and amended the maps. So what you should have sitting on your agenda is a draft bylaw and set of maps which reflects all of the direction that you've provided through those deliberations. 
Thank you, Nick. Any <laughs> questions on the of Nick and Dennis? Dennis, did you want to add anything? No? Oh, just through the chair, just bring to your attention there were three, um, three roads where you asked us to go and identify uh, an appropriate um, location for those speed limit changes, um, Kinlock Road, Wakeman Road and Crown Road um, and in, on page 60 of the diligence you'll see there about three quarters of the way down where we've identified where those locations um, were determined and that was on the basis that the, um, the 70 and 80k speed limit require a minimum distance so for a 70k zone you would require a minimum distance of 500 metres, 80k it's 800 metres, go out onto the road, see where that minimum distance lies and then make sure that wherever the location is, is outside of that distance but it's got the appropriate site distances, um, it's not on the, in the middle of a blind corner or something, so that's why the locations have been settled at what they are. Thanks. Dennis, uh, Councillor Ackman? So if we adopt these uh, bylaws today, when do you see the implement, implementation taking place, Dennis? Uh, speed limit changes will be on the 1st of December for the majority of them. Um, the Control Gates Hill, Wairaki Drive area is the 1st of May. Councillor Hackling? Uh, <laughs> 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 Through the chair, yeah. Your Worship. That's John. Your Honour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Dennis, just on page 70, just wondering why Tupper Road's got a, was in green. It's a, it's a drag strip. <laughs> you know, on the Legion, it says roads are speed limit. I know it's some private land, but. Um, Land, but, uh, uh, at first glance, that's because it's 100k. Re remembering that the speed, the speed zones that we brought to you were those that had been identified through prior consultation, and that at a later stage we will bring to you the speed management plan. Um, so when we bring through that speed management plan, that's going to encapsulate all of the other roads around the district and would pick up the likes of Tupperer Road. Okay, thank you, I understand it. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Harvey. Um, so, 1st of May for which ones? coming? All 1st of May is Wairaki Drive, the 50k zone from um, just north of Hooker Falls Road. Um, that will be the 1st of May, the rest of them will be 1 December. So when are the traffic lights going in at Norman Smith? Uh, that would all coincide with the change in that um, speed limit. So that's I... Th that's the for the yes. I thought they were going to be in this year. So, so that, that scheduling is the reason for the delay, so the traffic... The traffic lights um, can only happen when the speed limit is, is lowered, um, and the speed limit can only happen when the um, other work, like the works around the um, potentially reducing the passing lane, mm. or re removing the passing lane, the entrance way, etc. So, so it's just a, a matter of that extra time is to allow that that sequencing to happen. So it has to go physical work in, co in collaboration with the speed limit change and collaboration with the traffic lights. I know. <laughs> I don't. I don't understand this. So Christmas, still. Christmas. Not that I'm in a rush to get the lights, but <laughs> however, it's just not making sense. When we did, we changed our thoughts and said go for the traffic lights to get it going, and now it's not. I guess the question <laughs> of Dennis is, can that? Is there any way of that being pulled forward? Is the question. <laughs> While he's thinking about that, I have to echo Councillor Harvey's comments because part of the reason we made that decision about the lights was because you guys wanted an interim solution while we walked through the transport strategy and to now be talking mid-2019 for our interim solution, it's, yeah.
on the 1st of July, the long-term plan, well, prior to the 1st of July, the long-term plan was confirmed. That long-term plan provided the funding for, amongst other things, the traffic lights and the calming on um, Waraki Drive. At that point, we can start the process to engage consultants to design the traffic lights and all of the other ancillary works leading up to the um, to the implementation of the speed limit. That all takes time. So why weren't we told that earlier in the piece so that we aren't telling the public what's happening when it's not? This is so frustrating. It goes back to roundabouts, it goes back to all yeah, of this stuff. We've got we could have had more time to do some um, more due diligence. You were always told of the of the sequencing. <coughs> um, yeah. I think the the May might be slightly different to because I think the from my memory the previous discussions we talked about waiting we couldn't do it implement it before Christmas and so waiting for the end of the busy period and so yeah you know, in my mind that was that was March ish like after I mean is generally when we mm -hmm. start construction so. But we always talked about that sequencing and that work that was required. You know, you can't just put in a set of traffic lights in as simple as simply digging a hole and putting a set of lights in. There's, there's all of the, the changes around that and the design and then the physical construction. Not, notwithstanding the fact that you obviously have set in the long term plan that the decision in, with the consultation process, there was, there was quite good, there was a lot of support for doing something. Um, with the roundabouts of traffic lights, and we withdrew most of our program subject to uh, the transport management strategy. Um, silly question is obviously when is the transport strategy, when is it going to be completed? So, I mean, next 12 months or six to 12 months. So, whether it is, I mean, I, the question is with the development of full development of that transport strategy, is that roundabouts or lights so going, to be, going to be valid, going to be necessary? So. Yeah. The transport strategy, through the chair, the transport strategy, as Aidan mentioned at the workshop yesterday, wasn't going to get down to the level of detail of determining what was going to happen at a particular intersection and what treatment there might be. It was at more strategic level about what um, routes <coughs> um, were appropriate for the various types of um, modes of transport and what competing. Um, drivers were for using those routes and therefore what types of treatments might be appropriate on those routes but certainly not for specific intersections and specific treatments. I absolutely agree with what you're saying. On the other hand, in the event I know, for example, in the event of a second bridge coming in or not going in, that would change the dynamics or the traffic around coming over the bridge, for example. So you may or may not need well, I, I admittedly, and I accept that pop, probably uh, not universally probably appreciated by the community, uh, putting a set of traffic lights for four or five hundred thousand dollars is and maybe taken out at some stage in the future. There's still an option, was well, probably going to be the option, but yeah, it's just it's just my my view. So, so there's no way that we can fast track and get these in before Christmas. We will go as fast as we can, but we also, um, <coughs> councillors, should bear in mind that it does take time to build stuff on the network, um, and we have a very constrained construction time with Cycle Challenge and Half Iron Man um, pre-Christmas. Um, so any works that would have to be done generally have to be completed before that. Um, so. Physically, we're limited in the amount of time we've got available to build stuff on on the road network, especially in, in um, high where there's high volume numbers. But Iron Man's in March, isn't it? No, I said half Iron Man. Oh, half Iron Man. Yeah, That's so uh, December, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. We're pretty much. We, we're, if we're not if we're not built built by um, by middle of November, then we have to wait until March. Yeah. And in Taupo, because we don't build over those yeah, events issues. in Christmas, we, we create more issues than what, than what it's worth. Yeah. Sorry, okay. ju just from a, a pedantic policy perspective, there's also another risk you need to bear in mind too. If you bring forward uh, in a hopeful way your implementation of traffic lights and don't hit that target, 
you then run into trouble around the uh, timing of your speed limit coming into place as well. Um, so it's, it's critically important that the timing of the speed limit come in at exactly the same time that the traffic lights are implemented as well. So by bringing forward and trying to rush your traffic lights, you may end up misaligning those two processes. Uh, and my suggestion would be if you were going to try and bring forward the implementation of the traffic lights, you would need to readdress when that speed limit came into place on Waraki Drive. Because, yeah. thought we had. That's, that's, We can't speed the that up. The, the bylaw introduction. We can't speed any of that up either. Nothing. Well, you you can't have a slower speed again until you've done the physical work and and the lights. So well, the lights you can do the speed slow the speed without the lights, but you can't do the speed without the physical work around it. And again, the construction window is between now and and middle of November. Um, Dennis, I'm looking at you, you're the expert, but the ability to be able to design and tender and construct between now and then I would have thought would be very, very limited. Um, and again, remembering you know, this design takes time and then the tendering process, you see it to sign it off when it comes here, but there's two months worth of work before it comes to you to get to that point, so that stuff all has to happen. The last thing you want to be doing is over Christmas. <coughs> yes, can't. Right. I just think maybe we need to seriously put the whole thing on hold and because we are just so far behind what we said we'd do. I don't feel comfortable. So with respect, I, I disagree that you're behind what you said you'd do. We, we Again, we always talked about at the end of that Christmas period, the end of the, the summer period, so March, starting the, starting the work. Um, remembering that, coming back to what Councillor Williamson talked about in terms of the transport strategy and the second bridge, even assuming that the second bridge, you, you decide that you want to do that and you want to do it now, it's, that's still a three to five year process before it's in. So these lights are, are designed to go between now and whenever that is. And in fact, you remember we talked about even when the bridge is in, it's likely that you'll still need signals on that intersection, you'll still need lights there. Okay. <coughs> All right, uh, so the speed limit uh, by law. Yeah. I'm just concerned that this recommendation um, that we're going to approve all it does say is adopt the speed limit bylaws 18 and approves the draft response letters to the submitters. Uh, I would have thought just that that should have had those dates to be effective from within the, the recommendation. I know it's in the report, but yeah. It's in the bylaw as well. It's in the bylaw as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, any other questions or queries? Right, the recommendation adopts the speed limit uh, bylaw 2018 and approves the draft response to submit us. Lead us to submit us. Could I have a mover, please? Thank you, Councillor Stewart, seconded by Councillor King. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. It's against, carried. Right, item number 5.8. Eight, correct. Receipt of final statement of intent for the CCOs. Mr. Fox. <coughs> good afternoon, Your Worship. Good afternoon, Councillors. Good morning, Councillor Body. By my, by my reckoning, it must be about 10 to 6 in the morning in Greece at the moment, so I do admire your, your, your diligence. Um, I'm standing in for uh, John and Jessica. Um, this is a rather mechanical item, uh, forms part of the statutory framework underpinning council controlled organisations and a lot and the like. So to receive the final statement of intent documents for council controlled organisations, you had the drafts 
I think in April um, there were some minor changes to one which have been incorporated I think into the DGLT SOI um, to here for your um, consideration to receive those documents take the item as read um, I'm not happy to answer any questions but I'll do my best if you have any as will my colleagues okay thanks mr. Fox any questions or queries of uh, mr. Fox regarding the CCOs Pretty straightforward. All right. Thank you very much. Can I have a mover, please, for that? Moved by Councillor Jollin, seconded by Councillor Har Harvey. All those in favour, please say aye. It's against. Carried. Thank you. Brian, uh, 5.9, Council Engagements, August 2018. Tina. I've really got nothing to add um, to those at the moment. So we've got a, a reasonable workload there for, um, for August. Okay, thank you very much, Tina. Any queries or questions of those dates? Councillor Park? Hmm. All right, I have a mover, please. Moved by Councillor Stewart, seconded by Councillor Park. All those in favour, please say aye. 5.10 members' reports before we go back to Hadley. Councillor Park. Um, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, the, uh, a couple of us attended the local government New Zealand conference in Christchurch um, a couple of weeks ago. I'm happy to speak to it now, or if, if I can be given a couple of weeks, I can provide a written report. I think a written report would be good. Thank yep. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other um, members' reports? Yep, cool. All right, thank you very much. So I have a mover, please. Um, those members' reports be received. Thanks, Councillor Truman. Second of Councillor Williamson. All those in favour, please say aye. It's against. Carried. All right, Hadley, back to 5.5. What have you come up with? No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> HDMI. Okay. So the reason we put that in there is because the rest of your strategy is underpinned by an assumption that we will provide sufficient land to meet demand because oversupplying has risks associated with it, particularly around the cost of infrastructure provision and management. What we wanted to signal is that we're not going to undermine the rest of the strategy by putting Fori Ra in. Because essentially, as we've demonstrated through the numbers, there may not necessarily be the demand, at least in the short to medium term, for Fori Ra as a growth area. What this does is it enables those decisions to be played out in the context of the private plan change hearing. So if through that private plan change hearing the applicant is able to demonstrate that there is sufficient demand, that the proposal is of such unique nature that it should be able to go ahead, then we simply reflect that in the strategy. But it's really shifting that decision making 
into the space of the private plane change application. So, Nick, just to clarify, what's the timing around that private plan change? I, I'm a little reluctant to put a time frame on it, given they've been working on it since 2007. Uh, it's, it's in now, it's been lodged, uh, we've requested further information from them, um, and there's a process they're going through around um, making a decision about whether they wish to provide that further information. Then there are a series of decisions for council to go through in terms of deciding whether to accept that or reject it or adopt it. And then there are submissions and further sub oh, submissions process and then hearings. That could be anywhere between um, six months to two years. So it's highly likely that you'll have the request request to adopt it well? Yes, most, most certainly. Uh, can I just ask yes, a question, Nick? Um, Nick, with the further information you've asked from them, is part of that that they fund a, um, a an urban capacity strategy, and that is that just for the area, or is that for the district? Uh, so, as part of the further information, we've asked them what well, we've asked for the commissioning of a report to look at the costs of providing infrastructure to this development. We're conscious there are significant upfront <coughs> costs um, in terms of not only the bridge and the roading, but also the water and the wastewater infrastructure before you get to the first lot. Um, and we've asked for an assessment of whether there are any opportunity costs that council or, or the decision maker should take into consideration. So those are the two aspects that we've been talking to them about providing. Right. So, your worship. Um, so, we can't put a green blob at Farrarowa showing residential development. Yes, that's correct. You can't. You no, you can't. So, so the green indicates land that is zoned and ready to be developed. So for example, the uh, EUL land that council owns has been zoned as yeah, ready yeah, to yeah, be developed. Yeah. Yeah. So Nick, just a question. If those three options that you said when plan change is in and it gets assessed, if council decided to adopt that plan change, which would be the saying, yes, we totally agree with this and we're going to take it, would these words stop that adoption? No. Or you could if you adopt it. What you want to be careful is you don't undermine the strategy and the requirements for this request for one specific area which we're discussing. I, I, I fully get your support for it, but don't undermine the direction of travel and what you're trying to achieve at a strategic level to try and deal with one issue. Okay? You've got to find a way through that. Is, <coughs> that does make it very difficult for this group that have spent all this time, all this money and all this energy with the documents that they had to use to, to get where they're going. And they've done it in good faith. And so I'm still of the opinion that I would like... Um, I'd, how do I put this? I'd like some assurance that Council isn't going to put objections up there just because they don't want this to happen. I'd like it to make sure that um, while they have to go and through and prove all the points that you're asking for, that it will be done in a, in a positive light, um, not just, just to fit a new strategy. Um, just through the chair, um, this, is, this document is to go out for consultation, yeah, it isn't does. it? Right, so the, the next appropriate process. channel rather than this debate, is to submit. And Councillor Parker's correct? Yeah, yeah, look, I agree with you, Anna. Uh, you know, this submission is, a, is, is the, the proper way to, to, yeah. to think this, but I, but I think it's just the, the overriding issue, which is <laughs> we've got a community here, nothing new, always signalled it, invested to support the argument sort of coming to us. So so are we a council of enabling? 
in, in helping our communities to grow or not. So I think there's just that high level thing which is, look, we have the ability to make a decision here or we can just keep on sort of going around it <laughs> and finding ways to stop it. I, I don't understand. We, we're trying to develop our communities in our district. But I just think not the wording that the officers have come up with giving you enough assurance that they're going to stop and you can do that? Well, no, when I see that, while some challenges are coming straight <laughs> I'm just sorry through the chair. Right, I totally respect my colleagues' opinions on this. Um, we, we workshopped this last year. Like I did, was right. Okay, so yeah, it's a bit hard to sit here when we've been through all of this and had this debated like this when the staff have finally got to a draft and a draft consultation document. You start pulling it apart when we've actually been through been through um, a process so I just think it would be a bit unfair just to I mean uh, the updated words um, if, is that is if that's not enough yeah. given that we're, this has been in the pipeline since September last year and this document has to go out for consultation no decisions are being made right now and it's going to go through quite quickly so we will reach a discussion and we will have hearings if we need to or however it's going to work so let's let the process go through. If, if this is unique and it's special character, it will come through in that process. Just like the words change. Well, <laughs> I think that that one line that just is like what it was just said. Well, what about while there may be some challenges in this land? Well, not not, not, not mentioned. It will be up to the developers to demonstrate there is demand. Can I just clarify that those two elements there are around demonstrating a demand for the land and assessing the cost to the community and ensuring they're appropriately managed are two of the key tests that the plan change will have to meet if it's going to be approved under the Resource Management Act. That this is, a, and perhaps we didn't point it out earlier, but this is a strategy which is being developed under the Local Government Act, but it has direct flow-on implications into the Resource Management Act space in terms of how private plan changes are dealt with and in terms of how the district plan is dealt with. So we've got to be very conscious <coughs> that any direction we provide is going to stack up under the Resource Management Act. And this is when you, when you go back to the 2006 version of the strategy, you will see there's quite a heavy emphasis on making sure that the direction that's provided through there will again meet those tests under Section 32 of the Resource Management Act. So, so Nick, um, Maggie was saying they've already lodged the private yes. plan change. <coughs> Excuse me. Does it make any difference, or will it make any difference, to deal with the with it under the present operative 2050 to this new one, the revised? The revised yes, yes. I, I believe it will. Will it make it easier for them or harder? Uh, it ultimately depends on what TD 2050 says once you've made your decisions following hearings. So, so because, they've, because they've lodged, Will it be treated under the old one? It, it will be treated under whatever the TD2050 policy is at the time that they go to hearings. At the time they, they go, go to, to hearings? Hearing. Yes, on the private plan change. Okay, 
So this could be operative by then? That would be our expectation, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Could we change the wording slightly where it comes in, um, where it says just remove the challenging, the, it's the challenging, because the challenging is, is putting a challenge out there. If you could just, while there may be, while, while there, they will need to demonstrate or that there is a demand for the, this land use, instead of yes. challenging challenges yep. to demonstrate. Because I think the words are confrontational, yeah. well, not look, accommodating. Very comfortable with that change. Very comfortable with that, that wording. Right, okay. So I'll get that added in. So ultimately, all that we'll need to do is just change the resolution to be as amended and we can get this included.